Tech Talk Tuesday, number 91. Hey, Matt, Charlie. Golly, Charlie. You deserve free decals. Raymond. God bless you, man. Alan. I got some good stuff I want to tell y'all. Some ideas about some engine things that have just come through my... My, uh... Facebook page and my Instagram about people's misconceptions and misunderstandings about stuff. I want to share that with you guys. And also, I want to talk about my new motorcycle. Well, it's not my new bike, but it's the first time it's been running just recently. Is Buck. I call him Buck. That's just his nickname. Like Bagzilla was Bagzilla. Hey, Dave, Todd, Wayne, Scott, Lamar. Hi, y'all. Good to see y'all name on here. See everybody. Um, I'll sit on the couch here and talk to you for a minute about some stuff, and then we'll go to the board. But uh, it's really great. I can see some cool names coming up on here. Let's see if I can switch this over. Nope, that's not how you do it. Like this is how you do it. There you go. Hey, y'all. Okay, I'm just going to chill on the couch here for a minute. And I wanted to tell you guys about um, a little bit about the history of uh, we've been racing for a long, long time in, um, with the motorcycle drag racing and cars and stuff and learned a lot about engines. Hey, Chaz. Hey, Jeff. Doug. And um, I was going to just tell you that, you know, it's some interesting stuff uh, now that I've retired. And I wanted to tell you guys, the newbies that are here watching, I don't build engines for people anymore. I work on my own stuff now and I give advice and I have a consulting business and we design camshafts and I order some special pistons for people all the time. Hey David, Nat, hey Ray, Robert, good to see you guys. Thank you for tuning in. So I had a real funny, not a real funny, but it was an interesting story I thought of today I wanted to share with you. It's back in, back in the days when we were running turbo Kawasaki's and we were building a lot of them for customers all over running IDBA and NMRA, and, and we ran all over the East Coast and a little bit of the mid-central mid part of America. But we delivered one to uh, Kentucky. I guess it was it was called Ohio Valley Dragway in, like near Louisville, I think it was. And Greg and I were in a cube truck, the Chevy cube truck, black cube truck, and we, were, we delivered a turbo bike to a client there. And he, when we finished that Sunday, we gave him the motorcycle and he paid us cash. And in 1982 or three, I think $30,000 was probably like 60 or $80,000. And it was cash and it was in a grocery bag and it was rolled up and we put it in the console in the dually. No, in the glove box of the cube truck. And uh, Greg had a, a little, pistol with him all the time. I had a pretty substantial uh, 1911. Um, uh, I think it was an ACP 45 that I used to just keep in the truck. And that was back in the day when that's just what you did. You know, everybody had something like that. Hey, Bryce. Hey, Rashad. But um, we, was, we were driving home that Sunday night and we got really tired. So we pulled over in a cheap little motel, $20 a night motel or $15 a night. It wasn't much, but this was pretty far back. And we went in and I grabbed my gun and grabbed my bag of cash and took it in the room. And Greg's getting ready for bed. I was getting ready for bed. And we were really tired and we just fell asleep. And somewhere along the way there, I put the bag of cash and the gun in the drawer of the little console between the beds where they have the phone. And you open the drawer and there's a Gideon Bible in there. And not much of any, maybe a, maybe a pizza menu or something. And I put the cash and the gun in there and we went to sleep. And... Next morning we woke up and um, I called home on the phone, called Jackie and talked to her before she went off and to work and we were catching up on stuff and Greg got out there and got the truck warmed up and I got up, hurried, brushed my teeth, got my bag, packed up my junk, got run outside, got in the truck and we drove off. Everything was going good. We were on I-65 maybe going south, I believe, and headed towards Georgia at the time and we were just driving along and um, well, probably 50 miles into the trip, and I said, oh my gosh. He says, what? And I said, I left 
the cash and the gun in the drawer in the motel room. And I mean, we both were panicking. I mean, like panicking. We were driving down the road and I'm like, there's no exit, there's nowhere to turn around. I mean, it was like nowhere to turn around. So we had to go about 10 more miles and found an exit and we got off and crossed over and I drove as fast as that truck would go back 50 miles maybe back to the exit where we were at the motel and pulled off and pulled in the, into the motel parking lot throwing rocks and sliding in there and sure enough when we pulled up there was my <laughs> our motel room door was open and uh you could see that the the cleaning crew was in there working the rooms you know changing the bed linens and all that stuff and he said what are you going to do and i said I'm going to go in the room and I'm going to get my gun and I'm going to get my money and I'm going to leave. And if the, if it's not there, I hadn't got a plan. So I walked in the room and the cleaning lady was in there and she screamed, ah, and I shut the door and locked it with her in there and me in there. And she said, no, no, no. And she backed up to the sink and I went over to the cabinet between the beds and pulled the drawer open. And there was my grocery bag with the cash. I opened it up, looked in it. There was my 1911. I put that in the back of my pants, unlocked the door and went out, got in the truck and drove off. Anyway, that made a big impression on me uh, that day that we got away and she got away because she didn't look, she wasn't looking for some fancy loot or something that got left behind by some two dumb boys racing out of Georgia. Uh, but it was a great day to learn and we lived through it. And that, I'm telling you something, man, that money had to go to Sumter Bank and Trust to pay for all the parts and labor we had in that motorcycle. I think we might have got 30 or 40 grand that day, but I bet you, Jackie will tell you, we looking it up in the books, we probably had <laughs> we probably had 50 grand in it. So we we weren't like making out. We were just trying to pay our way and and anyway, those are good times. We learned all those things along the way. So I just wanted to share that quick story with you for a minute because now uh in today's time things are so different and uh, there's the internet and cell phones and stuff that makes it a lot different. But boy, was that some interesting times running up and down the highway like that. And uh, we weren't the smartest tools, the smartest, sharpest tools in the shed, but we were winning races and we were traveling all over the country, but we made it. But anyway, I'm going to change over now to um, Buck, uh, my new twin cam motorcycle. And uh, I'm going to flip this, this, this uh, camera over. All right. Now, if you don't know who Buck is, I'm sorry. Take a minute when I get done and go to my Facebook page or my Instagram and look at that gold motorcycle. That gold motorcycle is a 2003 Road King and it's called, um, it's a CVO and it's it's got the factory gold paint job. And I saw it and I wanted it and I made a deal with a guy, he had it in Alabama and I bought it and I got it home and rode it around for a little while. And, and we had Bagzilla at Star Racing and at Bagzilla, we were running a um, a red 2013 Road King that we had built. We did, we bought a um, so a 143 in pieces for S&S &S 143. We bought a set of cases and a set of cylinders and a set of, uh, we had a set of, oh, we ordered a set of B2 heads. And we made a 135 to go in that 2013 Road King so that it would be a big bore short stroke so that we could make it fit in a stock bike because at the time we were running in a class where you had to run a stock frame where you couldn't notch the frame. So that created this thing that I'd been chasing for years. And I wrote down the, um, the uh, S and S bore limits and the history of how this all happened to me. And I went, it was a 20 year process as I learned through car racing, pro stock, pro stock car racing back in the nineties that the biggest bore was the winner always because we could put the most valve, the most airflow in the in the induction and exhaust system by having a bigger bore because with a big bore, you can put bigger valve. So I'll go into that after I get through with my, my, my story about Buck. But Buck is the last project we've done so far during this history of 40 years of learning about these bore and stroke and these engines. And Buck is um, 2003 twin cam you guys with, with Milwaukee eights and you guys with car engines and race engines, that's all good and everything. But let me tell you, man, a four, 400 V eight, 4.44 bore with a 4.1875 stroke would make a 520, maybe a 518 and change V eight. Okay. 
Now, um, also, you guys that can't get this live, just understand that I am going to record this, and I'm going to give it to Jackie, and she will move it to our Instagram uh, and our YouTube, not Instagram, I'm sorry, our YouTube page where this will be saved and shown later. Um, I see where some of you guys can't watch right now, but that's okay. I just want to tell you thank you for tuning in. But anyway, I wrote a couple notes about it. That 520 V8 would be a really high RPM V8, big bore, where you could get some valve size in it. So with the 4400 bore, what we did was we bought, we got a set of uh, 126 cases. And the 126 is a leftover piece from the early 2000s where um, s and came out with a tribute engine. They had a S&S 145 tribute, which was a 4.375 bore with a 4 and 15 sixteenths <laughs> stroke. That's almost a 5-inch stroke, and it made 145 cubes with only a 4.375 uh, bore. And... Anyway, that thing was serious with a with that much stroke. Almost five inch stroke with a four point uh three seven five bore. And of course it was flow limited because of how big uh the stroke was. And um but anyway, we, we got a one twenty six, which was the same engine, but it had a short stroke. It had the four point three seven five bore, but it instead of a four point nine hundred stroke, it had a four point one stroke and man that thing ran good because it it wasn't uh it wasn't piston speed limited it was it was only 126 cubic inches and it had the biggest heads that SNS made their B2 heads which were uh came stock with a 2.2 intake valve and a 1.8 exhaust and they had really big ports cast in them and they made a lot of power so we decided to build a 126 with a big bore and a short stroke. So we we bought a set of 143 cylinders, and we shortened them up a ton. And then we put the 126 crank in it. We sent that crankshaft, since this is old school, we sent it to the boys at GRC, Stanley Gardner's Crank Daddy over there. They took it all apart and put a new pin and new bearings and honed the rods to the right clearance and put it together nice and straight for me. So I feel really good that we have a bulletproof uh, crankshaft in uh, it's Gardner Racing Concepts. You guys that only know of one crank builder or a couple of different crank builders out there, this is the new kids and no, they're not. They've been around for a long time, but they are really making fast Milwaukee eights and fast twin cams. Uh, they did all of our Suzuki cranks, our school bike cranks, GRC built the Winston cranks for when we were Team Winston with Angel and won all those races, won all those championships. So I probably, at Star Racing, we maybe had 60 or 80 NHRA ch uh, championships and Wally's with a GRC prepared crankshaft. So as we changed over to the V-Twin business, it was easy for us to go right back over to GRC and get Stanley and the boys at GRC to work on our stuff. And I call him Crank Daddy because if you saw my trophy case one day, you'd understand how many crankshafts he's built for me. But back to my 2003 CVO Road King, there's pictures of it all over the internet. And I'm inviting you now to go to, um, Bagzilla has his own Facebook page. It's just Bagzilla. And on the Bagzilla page, that was my first really fast um, street legal bagger that ran 930s and 40s all the time with me on it. And all motor, no nitrous, no turbos, no supercharger, just straight motor. And it was fun, fun bike ride. It would go over 145 in the quarter and it created a lot of uh, hype and helped build the bagger class i didn't invent the bagger class but we sure helped with roger edgerton and the guys from pennsylvania up there with greg Dahl's team up there did a great job and of course uh king kong and baby kong with asim chandri and that whole gang coming in uh ron smith wanted to build a real fast bagger here in georgia there in georgia so we did that so there's a lot of great names that helped us get there but Quit rambling, go back to Buck. It's got a set of B2 heads that I had saved over from a long time ago, had a set of 126 cases and a 126 crankshaft, and we were able to make a 129 or a 130 out of it by putting a bigger bore and the same stroke. So now it's got titanium CRN coated 2.3 intake valves and 1.85 exhaust valves, and we have our own 680 cam, which we call the Bagzilla cam, it's a twin cam gear drive 
and with the 1.725 SNS roller rockers, it makes 720 lift, and it is one seriously fast. Uh, hey, Darren, one really fast uh, package. So that's what we have, and then we got a. If you look at back, uh, Buck now, you'll see he's got a really cool looking stainless pipe that the boys at uh, GMP Motorcycles did for us. Uh, built a custom pipe. I had him put a, since it had the really big flanges on the B2 heads, it had a four bolt flange. And I asked him to put me a two inch pipe at the head and then go just a third of the way to the collector and go to a, a two and an eighth pipe. And then a third of the way to the collector go to a two and a quarter pipe. So now it's got a two and a quarter collector going into a two and a half uh, tailpipe into a me megaphone muffler. And that, if you watch that, any of my feed or any of my um, uh, pictures and posts and videos and Instagram, you'll see Buck has really come a long way. What do I expect out of Buck? Um, I'm hoping to make 170 horsepower, 180 would be awesome, but it is a rider. I'm, I'm going to run some higher octane. We're going to mix a little race gas with, with the 93 so I don't spark knock. But I'm going to try and dyno it tomorrow or Thursday and find out what kind of power it makes. I'm not really chasing a whole lot, but it's new, 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 new. The crankshaft is new from GRC. The valves are brand new. Titanium, they're CRN coated, which is a chrome-plated coating. And people ask me all the time, what do the heads flow? What do the heads, well, they flow a lot, and I don't know because we didn't flow them. We just put the biggest valves that would fit. We put the biggest intake valve that would fit, the biggest exhaust valve that would fit. We put the biggest cam that we could with the shortest duration and the shortest timing. We open the intake valve late so we don't have deep valve pockets in our 2618 alloy pistons that have nice thin rings that the rings are put exactly where I want them. They're gas ported on top and the ring lands are really tight to the ring so we can control that ring flutter. And I, it's gonna be a 7,500, 8,000 RPM engine because of this stroke. And the piston speed will not be critical for ring seal until we get up over 7,000 RPM. So that's one reason I love uh, a stroke like this because when you buy a 124 uh, engine from SNS, a twin cam, it has a 4.625 stroke, which is about a half inch bigger than this. So the piston's going way faster in the same amount of time. So the rings get overspeeded and it's hard to control those rings. So I'm a short stroke guy, big bore, love it. And uh, back to um, the lifters, we're running uh, SNS lifters and they're short travel. We put a spacer in them, we got a hundred thou travel. So that we, and, and we don't use the quickie push rods because they're real flimsy and they got little skinny little threads on them. We use some stout uh, push rods like a, um, Smith Brothers that has a, a really large diameter threaded piece so that, and, th and then also we order them the right length so they don't have a lot of extended thread to get out there and be like a pole vault. But I wanted to go back to the reason I put gas ports in it. And, and I had a guy ask me today, he said, hey, you put gas ports in my engine. Yes, I did. And he says, well, how long will my rings last? And I said, well, on an endurance engine, they run them uh, over a thousand miles wide open. Um, takes them several hours to do it, or you can drive it every day in Florida a lot and maybe get a hundred thousand miles out of it. But the gas ports don't wear out the rings sooner. That's a that's a misunderstanding, and I wanted to share that with you. The gas ports allow us to run a really nice design piston where we can build the ring lands tighter to hold the rings in check, where the rings don't flutter. So we make the ring lands really tight. As a matter of fact, we run less than one thou clearance, side clearance on the top ring. And this engine here has a um, buck, has a 0.9 millimeter in, uh, compression ring. The top ring is a 0.9, which is less, uh, that's 036, I think, 0 0.036. So it's a nice thin ring. It doesn't have some big wide, wide radial clearance and it's, uh, it's, a, it's friendly to the cylinders and it conforms easily because it's not a, a super thick, uh, like a 16th or a 043 ring where it's real thick and real wide and you can't bend it. It feels like, like it just doesn't comply. It doesn't give to the cylinders and that's really hard on cylinder walls. So you better, if you're running real stout, heavy rings that uh, don't conform to the bore size, like 
as you're going up and down a hundred times a second, you're going to wear out rings really fast. So I use lightweight, friendly rings that are friendly to the cylinder walls with a nice tight clearance on the piston with top gas ports so that when the, when the piston is under power stroke, the 7, 8, 900 PSI is going down, pushing the piston down, goes into those little gas ports on top and pushes the top ring out. And then when the pressure goes out the exhaust valve, now the rings relax and they don't wear. They're really nice. And then on the compression stroke, on the intake stroke, they have enough natural tension to them to seal to the cylinders when the piston goes down as the atmosphere fills in the cylinder. And then when the piston turns around at the bottom and goes back up on the compression stroke, a little teeny bit of pressure in the cylinder pushes the rings out again to compress the mixture. And then you light it 30 degrees before the top turn around, go back down on the power stroke. So the rings are made for several jobs. You want the rings to be stout when they need to be. You want them to be soft and friendly when you need them to be. And you also need them to conduct, like on the, on the compression stroke and on the um, intake stroke, they are transferring the heat out of the piston into the cylinder wall. So that's another thing that you've got to have. You, you just don't want more there than you need. Bore and stroke. All right, I'm going to talk about the history of this because when I got into racing engines, V-twins and stuff, the history around the world was you put a lot of stroke in your engine and you're going to pick up a lot of low-end torque. Well, a lot of us didn't realize at the time that we were induction limited. There were no nice cylinder heads. Even in pro stock back in 1970, they only used stock castings. The small block guys used Chevrolet castings, iron castings when... And uh, the, the big block guys would use the iron castings until they came out with the L88 head. L88 head was legal. And then the guys, Rear Morrison, Warren Johnson, those guys would weld them up and put a big bunch of weld on them and, 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 and mill them at an angle so they could get the valves. Instead of being straight up and down, they would lay them over so they could get a more of a downdraft on the intake ports. Well, we were so flow limited that if we could put um, more stroke to make the cube 500 cubic inch rule, we were able to make more power because we thought that more stroke meant more power. But what it meant was more cubic inches and more m cubic inches is where you got the, tr the torque from. As we have gained over the last 30, 40 years, we have learned the big bore has allowed us to put really nice cylinder heads. Now you've got four valve heads, you've got pro stock heads that are really tall with seven, eight, seven, eight inch long, seven or eight inch long valves in there with the port stood straight up and the blocks. They got five, three inch bore space blocks available for the pro mod guys and the mountain motor guys. Uh, pro stock cars are now allowed a four, 900 bore space, which means you can put a 4.750 bore and fill it with valves. And when you do that, you end up with a bore stroke ratio. Pro stock, okay, let's, let's take the old 302s that were really high RPM, really nice engines back in the 60s. They had a 4-inch bore and a 3-inch stroke. They gave us a 1.33 bore ratio. And what I did was I took, took the, uh, my AARP calculator and I put 4-inch bore divided by the stroke, which was 3 inches, and that gave me 1.33. Pro stock car at 4.730 bore by 3.5 stroke gives you a 1.35. So that's somewhere around the... The Optimum, NASCAR runs there, Pro Stock Motorcycles run there, and the, what we've all gravitated towards over the years has been bigger bore, bigger bore, bigger bore. And we make the rules fit by going down on the stroke so that we can um, get the most flow in there. And uh, I wanted to write this down because I see the guys out there now are buying 128 kits for your Milwaukee 8, you're buying... Um, you're buying uh, 131 kits for your Milwaukee 8, and those are giant engines because a twin cam came. You know, 103 was a really nice engine, and we put some 107s in them, maybe a 113, maybe a 107, and then they came out with the Screaming Eagle 110s, and those were big engines. And then Harley came out with a 120R for the twin cams, and that was a big engine. But they put big sleeves in them, and they bored the cases out, and they put the biggest bore they could given the studs in the case. Well, when the Milwaukee 8 came out in 2017, Harley did a great job of jumping past six more levels and putting a really big bolt pattern in there so you could put big bore in there. The thing that worries me on these um, 
I'm gonna set, write them down right here. A 128 and a 131. What worries me about these engine kits is they don't bore the cases. And the cases in the Milwaukee 8 are bored out to 4.18, 4.418. That's how big the hole in the cases are. That gives you a really nice base gasket and four studs. Then they sell you a set of cylinders that have a 4310 bore. All right, if you subtract the 4310 bore from the from the biggest sleeve that will fit in the stock cases, it's 4.418. That leaves 108 thou for cylinder wall. Per side gives you 054. Now, I don't know if you know, but... The cylinder wall is, a cookie cutter is about 050. Like when you got dough and you're gonna make cookies and you take the cookie cutter and you cut out the dough or you're making biscuits <laughs> and you have the little bisque dough cutters. These right here, y'all, that's less than a 16th of an inch. That is so skinny. And if you ever hone cylinders for a, a living or you got a really nice hone and you have a really nice aluminum cylinder and you got big thick sleeves in it and they step down at the bottom to go in the cases and they're only 054 thick. So you bore and hone those cylinders and when you, when you bore it, you hope, this is what the sleeve looks like without the cylinder. Okay, and then it's got a flange on top, all right? This is the part where the base gas goes. This is where the head gas goes. And this is the fin part with the fins on it. And this goes down into cases. What I'm talking about is if this was bored out to stock and it was a 4.125 bore and you wanted to go to a 4.310 bore and you want to stay in the stock case boring, you're going to have to bore this cylinder out to where this is paper thin right here. And this paper thin part, when you're in here honing with a power hone, if you, you, you check and you'll see, use a dial board gauge and go in there and see. If you hone for a little while, you'll take out a thou here and you'll take out none here. Hone for another 10 or 20 minutes, you'll take out a thou here and you'll take out none here. Because these cylinders at 050, I don't care if they're made out of steel, ductile iron, kryptonite, I don't care what they're made out of, they deflect away from the boring bar and they deflect away from the hone. So when you're honing it, a guy that's got really good, he's going to take his hone and he's going to stay down here. Like when you hone the cylinders, you go in and out with the hone, well, he's going to stay down here. Hone and 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 trying to get this to change shape and size. And I'm just not a fan of a cylinder that thin. So we are, or what I, my career has always been, to put more sleeve to it, bore out the cases, or go a little bit smaller because this number here, how thick these sleeves are, is more important than how big the pistons are. It doesn't matter if this is too big or real big and this is too thin. What's going to happen is you're going to get that thing that people talk about. You're going to get blow by. You're going to get oil puking out of your filters. You're going to get. Um, you're going to need to buy an A1 ventilator. All those bikes need an A1 ventilator. And I'm giving a shout out to Mike and the guys that sell those. You, know, you got to do a better job on your air cleaner so that you're not pumping the oil residue back through your intake and back through your throttle body. But this compounds the problem. It used to be, folks, that a Harley was okay because it was only a 107, no, a 103, a 110, a 107. And then they started coming out with these really big engines. Well, now the, the, the crankcase pressure leakage into the bottom end is, uh, my time has run out. Thank you all for watching. I, uh, Tech Talk number 91 is in the books. I had a great time sharing with you guys, and I will do better next time as I'll get more info together for you. And thank you all. May God bless. Check in for me next Tuesday at 92.